Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome deacons. I'm Tanya Zanish Belcher, Director of Special Collections, and we are happy to host this presentation today where we will take an in-depth look at the many artifacts and stories we have which document the history of athletics at Wake Forest. We are partnering with the Wake, Wake Forest Historical Museum located in Wake Forest, North Carolina for this event. Please send us any questions you have for our presenters in the chat and I will share them after the presentation. I also want to let everyone know we are recording this webinar and we will send it out to you later this week. A special thank you to Barry Davis and the ZSR technology team and everyone on the ZSR Board of Visitors. Our board's advocacy and support make our outreach efforts possible. If you want to learn more about the work of Special Collections, the ZSR Board of Visitors, or the library in general, please reach out to Mika Payden Travers. She will be emailing you after the talk with the recording link. Before I introduce our speakers, I also wanted to remind you we have two remaining programs this spring. The first is on March 30th, when we host Auburn scholar Sunny Stalter Pace, who will speak about her biography of vaudevillian Gertrude Hoffman. We have uh, Gertrude's papers. We will also have a program focusing on our Irish press collections on April 20th. You will automatically receive notifications of our events if you sign up for our newsletters. Again, just let Mika know. We are also planning our fall programs already, including a collaboration with the athletics department when we will have the opportunity to see their sports exhibits and memorabilia. For those of you interested in architecture, Professor Peggy Smith will be talking about the great homes of Winston-Salem and her forthcoming book. And finally, if you're interested in Wake Forest history, Wake's Mary Tribble will be speaking with us about her new book on Sally Waite coming out in the fall. So just some guidelines, all participants are on mute so we cannot hear you. If you have questions, please submit them in chat. I will repeat the questions and the speakers will respond to them as soon as we are finished with the presentations. And now on to some brief bio biographies of our speakers. First up is Ed Morris. Ed is the executive director for the Wake Forest Historical Museum in the town of Wake Forest. In his role as director, he promotes the mission of the museum to collect, preserve, and share the history of Wake Forest, both college and town. He has held the position of director for 15 years. He holds degrees from the University of Mount Olive, Campbell University, and an MA in history from North Carolina State. Sarah Solem is the manager of community and academic learning at the Wake Forest Historical Museum, again located in the town of Wake Forest. She supports student and faculty research into Wake Forest history, and organizes programs for community members, including book clubs, lecture series, and tours. Sarah is currently working on her PhD in public history at North Carolina State. And finally, Rebecca May is public services archivist in special collections and archives at the Z. Smith Reynolds Library on the Renolda campus at Wake Forest University. Her roles and responsibilities include assisting researchers with their varied projects and conducting them with research materials in the university archives, personal collections and manuscripts, and the North Carolina Baptist Historical Collection. Rebecca got her MLIS from UNCG and her BA in American Studies from the George Washington University. And now I will turn it over to our presenters. Well, thank you, Tanya. I think I'm first. Sarah, do you want to go ahead and start our uh, presentation and people will start seeing some of the artifacts? Okay, our first artifact uh, whoop, went away. Give me one second. Everything works perfectly in practice. Yep. There um, we are. All right, here. This is uh, the tiger pin. Uh, people were a little bit surprised to find out that the Demon Deacon was not the first mascot of Wake Forest College, Wake Forest University. As a matter of fact, the Demon Deacon wasn't even the second mascot. Um, about 1890s, the 1890s, uh, a student by the name of John M. Heck from Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, developed what was called the badge or logo for the college uh, and ad adopted school colors, which were old gold and black. 
Uh, the badge was a uh, oval, uh, black uh, oval, uh, with the WFC in it. Very shortly after, he continued to develop the mascot, which was uh, the head of a tiger, in, also in an oval, uh, with the uh, letters WFC below the tiger's head. Uh, so the lapel pin you see here was actually found on the grounds of the Wake Forest Historical Museum in uh, 2009, just prior to our constructing this building that we're sitting in today. As a matter of fact, today we have this pin on display almost exactly over the spot where it was found by a metal detector before we started excavation for the building. Um, ironically, uh, the pen uh, does not have the, the letters WFC on it anymore. They sort of were uh, lost in the uh, uh, aging process as it was buried in the, the dirt for about 120 years. Uh, by the begin beginning of the 20th century, uh, the tiger had lost favor. We don't know why, but uh, for some reason, it fell out of favor with the students uh, or with the sports teams. And for the next 20 or so years, the mascot was the Wake Forest Baptist. Uh, I like to uh, joke with people that that strikes fear in the heart of many in Methodist. Uh, so the Baptist was the second, second mascot and it was depicted by the, a Baptist preacher with a Bible under one arm and a large floppy hat. Uh, it wasn't until uh, October of 1923 uh, that the demon deacon was born. And it was born after Wake Forest uh, trolloped uh, rival Trinity College, now Duke University. Uh, Trinity had been ranked number one in rushing and football for three straight years. They were uh, ranked number one in the country overall in football in 1923. Um, and Wake Forest beat them 46 to three. The next day, Mylon Parker, the editor of the old Golden Black, uh, posted a headline that read, the Baptists played like demon deacons. Uh, and ever since that day, we have been the Demon Deacons. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a little question, uh, and you can put it in the Q&A, and uh, Tanya will review it at the end, um, or in the chat, whichever works better for you. Uh, what remains today of the tiger? Something that we all cherish dearly uh, remains of the tiger mascot. Uh, and from that, uh, I'll turn it over to Rebecca for a couple of artifacts. I'm going to actually jump in first oh, okay. with yeah. this um, baseball team photo from 1894 is one of the newest items in our collection at the museum. It was actually originally found in the attic of a former boarding house near Wakes Forest original campus and we just um, it was brought to us um, this this winter. Wake Forest College students started playing baseball regularly after the Civil War although it wasn't that popular right away. In fact, I was surprised to find out that students preferred to play bandy or hockey, and then later football, more than they liked to play baseball. Though students did enjoy a good baseball game in the 1860s and 1870s, school histories recall many club baseball games where Wake Forest students would play teams made up of townspeople, including alums from the college, neighbors, and business owners. However, not all were so enthusiastic about baseball's growing popularity at the college. After passing through Wake Forest in May 1869, the editor of the Biblical Recorder remarked that, at Wake Forest, the boys play baseball and spectators gaze at idleness. Baseball is an excellent employment for those who have nothing else to do. But we are sorry for those who in these busy times have nothing else to do. And several times in the 1890s and 1900s, members of the trustees tried to ban baseball along with other sports. Wake Forest's first intercollegiate baseball game was played against UNC in Raleigh on May 1891. And Wake Forest won the game in the 11th inning, 10 to seven. In 1894, when this photograph was taken, the team won nine out of 10 games. 1894 was also the year that a new baseball diamond was constructed on the grounds where the museum and the Calvin Jones house now stand. The field boasted grandstand seating that accommodated 250 people. This is probably one of 
our most cherished or our favorite artifacts at the museum. Museum staff love, love this poster. This poster hung in the dorm room of a Wake Forest student around 1915, Myron Banks Sr. The poster was pretty generic and it was mass produced in 1913. And that just means that the Wake Forest College seal that you see at the bottom of the poster was likely added after all of the posters were printed. This helps explain the unusual subject of the poster, a girl wearing ice skates and ready to play hockey at a North Carolina college that did not admit women. The poster evokes a golden era of illustrations depicting American girls. Between 1880 and 1920, artists began creating illustrations of girls for magazines, books, calendars, and advertisements. The illustrations often featured young girls dressed in the latest fashions, engaged in leisure activities, including athletics like this young woman here. You might know that some of the most famous illustrations of this period um, were the Gibson Girls, created by Charles Dana Gibson in the 1890s. Gibson tried to capture what he viewed as the perfect American girl, a slim-waisted, white, middle-class woman who was graceful and confident. The Gibson Girls represented the new woman, an independent, well-educated young woman who had talents and interesting ho hobbies, like skating. Wake Forest did not admit women until 1942. So I think that makes this poster pretty exceptional. However, during the 1921 summer session, Wake Forest welcomed Meredith College students to take courses on campus. Perhaps some of these young women took Wake's physical education course along with classes in history, French, Spanish, Latin, music, and geography. Our next artifact is an early cheerleader jacket. This jacket dates to uh, about 18, uh, 1928, 1929. Uh, cheerleaders were not a part of the athletic program in the beginning of the athletics in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, Wake Forest and UNC played in the first intercollegiate football game in October of 1888. Uh, the first cheerleaders uh, do not appear in the Howler until 1819. L.T. Gibson and B.T. Ward were the first cheerleaders that are listed there. Eventually, cheerleaders uh, came to be expected to be part of the game day events. Uh, women also were not cheerleaders uh, at Wake Forest until World War II. Uh, World War II, uh, 1942, is the year that women first became uh, full-fledged co-eds uh, at Wake Forest and also part of the athletics uh, organization. Uh, and in that same year, they joined the men as cheerleaders. Uh, this jacket belonged to Staley Thunderbird in the class of 1929. Uh, Thunderbird had a nickname of Pinky. Uh, the jacket that Thunderbird uh, wore uh, was for obviously a small man, uh, and that's perhaps why he had the nickname Pinky. We're not sure why. Uh, this jacket fits on a size two woman's display mannequin. Uh, and the mannequin is uh, uh, plenty small for the jacket. It still has plenty of room. So um, he obviously was quite a small individual. Uh, we have a photograph of those uh, three men cheerleaders in 1929, and all three are fairly small in stature. Hello, all. Um, this is the first artifact we're showing from Special Collections and Archives at ZSR Library, where I am coming to you from, and you can see the megaphone right over my shoulder here, and you'll see a few more of the items behind me. This artifact is very large, um, over three feet long, and is signed by the three male cheerleaders from 1930. Um, here they are from the 1930 Howler yearbook, Fred Fletcher, Daha Jester, and Fleming Fuller. You can also see megaphones of various sizes around their feet in the picture, along with the words to, oh, here's to Wake Forest below. And now for one of the stinkiest items we have in the archives. Uh, here we have Byron Pete Davis's leather basketball shoes that he wore in the first NCAA basketball tournament in 1939. 
Davis graduated in 1940 and played center for the Deacons. So I've pulled some of the old gold and black um, articles from the time. Here's Pete with the rest of the team as they made their way for the national title. If you're like me and you don't know a lot about Wake Forest basketball, you may wonder if they won. Well, keep going in the old gold and black and you can see the, the answer is no. Uh, they traveled to Philadelphia and lost to the Ohio State Buckeyes, but Pete's shoes made it back for his senior year and eventually showed up in our collection. One more image to show the shoes in action. Um, you can see here, Pete waiting on the rebound. And I thought I'd throw in the Howler yearbook photo of Coach Murray Greeson for those who know. We'll have a bit more men's basketball materials at the end of this slideshow as well, and another beloved coach. Well, our next object is an unusual looking football. Uh, it is a night football or a white football from 1946. Uh, in the early days of night football games, uh, stadium lighting was not particularly good. Uh, the lights were simple incandescent bulbs uh, in metal housings mounted on utility poles around the field. Uh, a normal brown football would, of course, be lost uh, to the receiver in the night sky. Uh, so to solve this issue, the footballs uh, used in, for the night games were made of white leather. Uh, this uh, made the ball much easier to be uh, seen by the receiver. Uh, here, this football has been signed. Uh, and uh, dated with the game. Uh, it was used for one of Wake Forest's very early night games, played on October 4th, 1946 against Georgetown. By the way, we did win this one. The score was Wake Forest 19, Georgetown 6. And then our next object, uh, very unusual. Uh, this is a leather helmet with an iron face guard, also from 1946. Dewey Hobbs uh, was a member of the class of 1947, uh, wore this very unusual helmet in the 1946 Gator Bowl game. Uh, after Wake Forest College, Hobbs became a leader among North Carolina Baptists. He pastored churches in several cities in North and South Carolina, including Wake Forest Baptist Church here in the town of Wake Forest, and also uh, churches in Winston-Salem. Uh, Hobbs was an outstanding football player in uh, his college days, uh, and he was one of Coach P. Head Walker's best players. Uh, along the way, in one of the latter games of the season, Hobbs broke his nose, and he was in jeopardy of not being able to play in the Gator Bowl. Uh, P. Head Walker devised his helmet with an iron face guard to protect Hobbs' broken nose. Uh, so without regulations on gear, uh, the face guard went relatively unnoticed. Uh, one would question if it was a good idea for either the player wearing the helmet or for the opposing players to have an iron face guard, uh, but no injuries were reported on either side due to this particular helmet. Uh, it's one of the more unusual items that we have in our collection. Uh, it uh, passes without a lot of notice except for young kids who are into football, and they always notice the face guard. The next item. Uh, you look closely, and it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, this is one of our most colorful. Uh, P. Head Walker, uh, which I mentioned just before, uh, was Wake Forest's longest serving and winningest football coach, Douglas Clyde P. Head Walker. We don't know why he had the name P. Head. Some people have suggested various reasons, uh, but none of them uh, seem to have any relationship to the other. Uh, P. Head often upset the Baptist leaders of a very conservative Wake Forest College in his day with his colorful language and antics, both on and off the field. Uh, Doc Murphy, uh, which many of you will remember uh, as Wake Forest premier cheerleader for generations, uh, once described P. Head as a short, bow-legged little man that couldn't hem a hog in a ditch. Uh, gives me a vivid image of what P. Head must have looked like. Uh, P. Head did win football games, however. Uh, the coach had a series of playbooks that he wore around his neck. Each book contained a dozen or so plays drawn in red and blue crayon. 
a hole punched in the upper right corner tied with a shoestring so it would hang around his neck during the games. Uh, here you see one of the two such playbooks that we have in the museum's collection that belonged to Coach Walker, uh, I mean P. Head. Uh, I offered uh, copies of these playbooks to Coach Clawson, but somehow he declined. Uh, Walker uh, resigned in a dispute with President Tribble over a $500 a year pay raise in 1950, and that led to President Tribble being burned in effigy by Wake Forest College students in a protest. Um, so P. had served, I think I said earlier, from 1937 to 1950, so uh, 13, almost 14 years, 14 seasons. Just need to take a second to unmute myself there. The white woolen blazer that you see on the right um, were worn by members of the Women's Recreation Association, the PE Majors Club, also known as the White Jackets Club. But this blazer here belonged to Dot Brooks George, a 1955 grad who is pictured in the photograph seated on the far left. The club was founded by Marjorie Crisp. Many of you might have heard of Crisp before. She became the first full-time woman faculty member in 1947, and then quickly established a physical education program for women, along with the Women's Recreation Association. During her 30-year career at Wake Forest, Chris led the university's efforts to organize women's intercollegiate athletics. This is probably my favorite collection in the museum. On February 22, 1951, 12 Wake Forest College students arrived in Buenos Aires for the Pan American Games. The United States Olympic Committee chose the Wake Forest College baseball team to represent the United States at the games for their impressive records in the 1948, 1949, and 1950 seasons. Since 1951, the Pan American Games have been held every four years. Most recently, the games were held in 2019 in Lima, Peru, and they're planned in, for Santiago, Chile in 2023. Our collections include a lot of memorabilia, souvenirs, and newspaper clippings brought home by the baseball team, including this very large poster on the far left, which is, I'm sitting, I can see it from where I sit now, it's over three feet tall for sure. Um, the postcard in the middle, which is much smaller, and the magazine on the right titled Mundo Deportivo. Most of the posters and postcards feature bright colors, the flags of the participating nations, and the Olympic rings and torch. The enduring legacy of the Pan American Games is often credited to Argentinian President Juan Perón. Following a series of military coups in Argentina, Perón, a populist leader, won the presidency in 1946 and main maintained control of the country until he was ousted from power in 1955. In 1949, the Perón regime began publishing the weekly magazine, the one shown here. And this magazine became an important propaganda tool for Perón. Magazine issues spoke about the accomplishments of Argentinian athletes and boasted about the president's ambitious domestic policies. The president also hoped that this special Pan American Games edition of Mundo Deportivo would impress all of the international visitors that came to Buenos Aires for the games in 1951. Well, it made enough of an impression that this issue was saved and donated to the museum and now connects the history of Wake Forest College to Argentinian politics. So I encourage you if you visit the museum to take a peek at this magazine. During the games in 1951, North Carolina newspapers reported on the Wake Forest College baseball team almost daily, following their games and leisure experiences in Argentina. The News and Observer even recruited Wiley Warren, the team's first baseman, and a sports editor for the Old Golden Black to write several articles for the newspaper during the trip. In his articles, Warren relayed the team's concern about their ability to speak Spanish, their enjoyment of Argentinian steaks, they really, really enjoyed them, and their frustration with overgrown baseball fields. They were not up to their standards. Ultimately, the team finished with a 5-2 record and tied Mexico for second place and took home certificates signed by the president and his wife, Eva Perón.
And the artifact you see here and just over my right shoulder um, is a majorettes uniform. Uh, in the 1950s, Wake Forest College was graced by two nationally recognized majorettes who twirled batons and led the marching band both on the field and in parades uh, across North Carolina. Sarah Paige Jackson Lewis uh, was of the class of 1952 and Mary Etta Perry Dormeyer, the class of 1956. They were both from the same small town in Eastern North Carolina. Marietta said she was from the very beginning Elizabeth City, North Carolina, protege of Sarah Page. They came to Wake Forest four years apart. So eight straight years, uh, one of the two performed uh, for similar routines for college events. This particular uniform belonged to Marietta. Another in our collection belonged to Sarah Page. Each young woman made her own uniform and stitched each sequin to form the deacon head and put the gold uh, braid around to perform to form the uh, shield on the uniform as well as have sewn it the, the entire uniform themselves. This particular one is made of black corduroy, so obviously it was for winter events. Uh, Sarah Page got to perform for President Harry Truman when he attended the groundbreaking ceremony for the Renolda campus in 1951. Uh, and it's often said that Sarah Page's uh, long red hair would touch the pavement behind her as she gracefully leaned back to toss the baton high into the air and catch it upon its return toward the ground. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Sarah Page Lewis this past year. Um, and I believe I was told she died from COVID, another one of our great losses. Uh, but she was a delightful person, and I'm sure many of you uh, have seen her through the years at Wake Forest events. So uh, to another beloved uh, Wake Forest person of the past, we're on to the 1970 Brian Piccolo Award. Um, you can see that right above my shoulder. And these are really where these live. I'm just in the room with them and in between is Samuel Waits traveling trunk. So we've got a lot of great stuff in here. Um, here is the Lewis Brian Piccolo Award, which is presented each year to the Wake Forest University player whose performance in the game with the University of North Carolina most typifies the play of Brian Piccolo, a gallant man and one of the university's greatest players. So here, uh, a picture of Brian Piccolo and a very brief clip of him in action on the field. Well, it seems like perhaps our audio is not working, uh, which is fine. Everything that we're sharing today, we will be sharing links to these videos, all the artifacts. Um, we'll be following up with you in an email. Um, so you will be able to watch this clip with sound. Um, it's just music, it's not any commentary. Um, but it is, this is a very short clip of a longer film of his highlights. So I hope you'll be able to watch that at a later time. Um, moving on to another exciting time in Wake Forest's um, football history. Uh, the Wake Forest football continued being great and the archive says the t-shirts to prove it, trust me, we have a million different t-shirts. But the Mickey Mouse decal for the 1979 Tangerine Bowl caught my eye for today. We have the decal itself on the left and the decal on the shirt with Mickey Mouse cheering on the Demon Deacons for the Orlando, Florida meetup with the LSU Tigers. Although the Deacons lost the game, Mickey has lived on in our hearts and our minds. So on the next, um, so you'll see Wake Forest Magazine has highlighted a few of the artifacts I'm mentioning today in their Object Curiosity series, which again, we will link in our resource guide. In that issue, you can read about Kent Newsom and his daughter Delaney pictured here and their own story of the Mickey Mouse t-shirt. You can look up the Tangerine Bowl on YouTube and take a look at the action, but instead of running another football clip, I thought we'd get just a quick look at another beloved Deke as he gets ready for the Tangerine Bowl. Again, uh, it doesn't seem like our audio is working. We can play, um, Sarah can play it and you can watch um, Arnold Palmer uh, his 
mouth move, but not actually hear him. Um, so we will again, follow up with you. He is saying, make sure you tune into the Tangerine Bowl as we cheer on um, the Deeks, go Deeks. And then he holds up his um, golf club at the end with his panel, uh, with his banner on it. So another favorite Deek coming through. If we go onto the next slide, since we don't get to hear Arnold, um, Mickey Mouse and Arnold Palmer, um, quite a duo, quite a sporting duo. I did want to show you the players from the year, the 1979 Deacon co-captains, Sid Kitson, James Parker, Mark Lancaster, and James McDougall. So here they are um, from a Wake Forest magazine item here. All right, it seems like this is a highlight. I said the basketball shoes were the stinkiest and perhaps uh, this could be considered the skimpiest item in our collections, in our artifacts. This is another artifact featured in the Wake Forest Magazine Object Curiosity Series. We have Tim, uh, Tom Laraway from the class of 1980 donated his Wake Forest swimming materials to the archives. He has fond memories of swimming for Wake Forest under coach Leo Ellison and representing Wake Forest at their last ACC appearance in 1980. Because of this recent contribution, the University Archives has received more materials from swimming alumni to make our collection even more interesting. So here we have some of that. And then in the interest of time, I was going to leave this one out, but I was encouraged that everyone would like to see a red strike mark through a Tar Heel pin, so I kept it in. This pin was sold in October 1988 for the Wake Forest UNC football game. I don't have any celebrities for this football entry, but the old gold and black shows that students were tailgating and there was quite a bit of merchandise for sale to boost the Deeks and sink the Tar Heels. So again, this is from the old gold and black. Um, how was the game, do you ask? The Deacons, led by quarterback Mike Elkins, beat the Tar Heels 42-24 on what was marked as the 100th anniversary of football in the state. Go Deeks. Now, I don't want you to think that we only have men's sports in our holdings. There are many mentions of the, quote, Lady Deeks in the archive. So I want to show you one of the many women's sports trophies we have in our holdings. Again, I will pan up and you can see many more trophies we have in here. Many of them are from the Lady Deek era. Uh, the women's basketball team had a great season in 1989, landing them a fifth seed in the ACC Conference Tournament and the winners of the Tobacco Road Tournament. For those of you who are unaware, which I think I am speaking to a crowd who is very aware, the Tobacco Road rivalry is used for the four ACC rivals in North Carolina, Wake Forest, Duke, Chapel Hill, and State. It is a play on the region's tobacco production, but you already knew that. They may have won the Tobacco Road, but the Lady Deeks did not go on to win the tournament, as you see from a follow-up from the Old Golden Black. Continuing with women's athletic achievement, we will now take a look at the 2004 Wake Forest Field Hockey National Champions t-shirt to celebrate their 2002, 2003, and 2004 three-peat. The t-shirt is signed by the team, and you can see the t-shirt on the left in black and white. Lucky for us, this, is all, this also begins seeing the old gold and black in color, uh, so since I've been doing so many clips from that. Here we see the 2002 OGB front page showing uh, victory. And then to the next one, and we see the 2003 sports headline where they went on to win the second year in a row. And for their three-peat, and finally in 2004, where they were hailed a Deacon dynasty upon winning their third in a row, which led me to look into Wake Forest's contribution to field hockey at an Olympic level. Some of the women on this particular uh, three-peat dynasty winning team went on to play on future Olympic games, and Wake Forest continues to excel in field hockey at both collegiate and Olympic levels. As my final artifact for this presentation, I want to take it back to basketball and another beloved coach, Skip Prosser. Here we see the Skip Prosser bobblehead from 2008. As you probably know, Skip Prosser died suddenly of a heart attack in 2007, as outlined in this headline. 
This is yet another of the artifacts highlighted in the Object Curiosity series in the Wake Forest magazine. There is extensive coverage of his sudden death in his biographical file, but I don't want to end on a downer, so I'll just show you how amazing he was. He began his career at Wake Forest in 2001 and led the Demon Deacons to the NCAA tournament in each of his first four years at Wake Forest. He is credited with sparking student participation in the Screaming Demons and for having the Demon Deacon enter the Lawrence Joel Coliseum on a Harley Davidson. And there he is the demon deacon in the Joel on a Harley Davidson. As we mentioned at the beginning of the program, we have pulled together some of a very small sampling of our artifact collections to highlight some athletic achievements. This does not wholly reflect the breadth and depth of our athletics holdings, nor of the student athlete experience. We have quite a few resources to share that cover the major victories and defeats, archery to soccer, groundbreaking firsts, African-American athletes joining the Wake Forest community, women athletic achievements, and so much more. I hope you enjoyed the very niche corner of the archives focusing on athletic artifacts. And we hope you can take a look at the resources that help round out the Demon Deacon. And I'm gonna share that now. We are also, as I mentioned, gonna be sending these, all of these links out or this link out to you. So don't scramble if you um, see it here that this is the only time you'll be getting it. You'll be, it'll be sent to you in um, an email, but this is, um, where we are putting together a guide. This is a work in progress. We've recently got some large accessions and as I mentioned, some um, alumni donors. So this will constantly be growing with as we receive more and more athletics materials. And you can stay tuned for details on the summer event we're working on, Wake Forest University fashion through the ages. And so we just pulled a few photos here from the 1910, 19 teens and 1980s. Stay tuned. Thank you, Sarah, Rebecca, and Ed. Um, so first up, just a couple things. Um, num someone suggested that maybe the woman in playing hockey could have been a cigarette advertisement. And then Julie also, uh, Ed, you had a question about the t what did we keep from the tiger? And Julie guessed we kept our colors, old gold and black. Julie would be exactly right. If she were here, we'd give her a prize. <laughs> so other questions that we have, let's see, let me go to the chat. Um, feel free to submit questions um, that you might have about um, our collections or about um, I have a question for Ed oh. that came up when Ed was speaking about Marietta's. Um, what it, what was her name? Marietta is her first name, and what's the last name? Marietta Perry. She was when she was here. Her married name is Marietta Perry Dormeyer. I spoke with her on the phone today. I believe she's on this uh, group. She called me to get a registration. So Marietta, if wonderful. You're here, we spoke earlier. <laughs> right here is her. And I did not uniform, put that right together. I didn't put together that that was the Marietta I was on the phone with until you said it. And I was like, I spoke with the Marietta this morning. Um, I did want to uh, make an observation that once the pandemic is over, we certainly hope that you will come visit us. We will be doing these events back in person. But again, we will still be recording and maybe doing live Q and A. So I think from here on out, we're going hybrid all the way but we really do look forward to having you physically come visit us as well. And I will also throw in, Tanya, as of today, the museum is back open. Uh, our schedule is a little abbreviated from what it normally was, uh, BC, before COVID. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Friday from nine until four. Uh, we will do weekends with advanced arrangements. And I should add, Special Collections is open by appointment, and you are welcome to contact us at archives at wfu.edu. Um, I just got a question about what sports do we wish we had more documentation of? Really, honestly, we will take anything that people want to give us, to tell you the truth, um, and especially anything that documents the student experience um, and their experience as student athletes. We are always looking for materials like that. Um, and we also uh, have a lot of what I would consider like cheer 
materials, t-shirts, buttons, um, and we're always looking for those too. It's part of that when you go to an athletic event, a lot of times those are part of that. So we are always looking to collect those as well. Other questions? Oh, see what else? Ah, yes, uh, there are many swimmer, many, many swimmers and divers who have more artifacts to be considered by ZSR. What is the process to inform you of what these are and how to get them reviewed for possible inclusion? In fact, I just spoke with someone on the phone today. Um, you are welcome to email me directly at Zanish, Z as in zebra, A-N-I-S-H, T as in Thomas, or Tanya, um, at wfu.edu. Um, and we are happy to talk with you about that and about what that process is like. Um, some of that may be a little bit delayed just because of the pandemic, but we look forward to adding things to our collections when we can. Any other questions? And someone made the, Eric made the observation, it would be great to have some of the, a few of the former athletes on the next meeting. We will try our best. That is an excellent idea. Sure. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Is there a special piece of memorabilia that you are prioritizing trying to collect? And I will open that up to the three of you. I mean, I would say just I know ZSR has a pandemic archives that they're collecting for. So I mean, you know, as students are you know, student athletes are dealing with everything we're dealing with right now, you know, um, some of the materials just kind of, you know, how are they coping? How do practices look different? That would be, you know, in the next several years, I'll be interested to see how, how the student ath um, athlete experience has changed and also how students, you know, what it's like going to school when you can't go to your team's, you know, sporting events, like what does that look like? Um, and so especially those students who who had that experience, you know, as a freshman or sophomore, maybe didn't as, as a junior or senior. So I think that, you know, encouraging young students to kind of take some time to reflect, although they'll, they'll have a whole lifetime to do that. Yeah, and we, we collect pretty much anything uh, that it has to do with Wake Forest when it was here in the town of Wake Forest. So uh, for the, we go well beyond in many areas, but for most uh, items, we're looking for things that reflect the history of the college when it was here. Yeah, and I'll second Sarah um, in saying the student experience beyond athlete, athletics, it just in general is something we're always looking for. As you saw, we have the yearbooks that tell, you know, who was on the sports team. We have the OGBs that tell you who who played and what the outcomes were, um, but we don't necessarily have the experience of the people who are doing the actual um, sports. So whether it's student athletes from now, swimmers from the past, um, experiences, artifacts, and materials about your own personal experience and life at the time while performing as a student athlete would be great. And again, it's not just athletes, it's all former um, students, current and former student experiences, always interesting. It um, fills in the gaps. I wanna share a message from Eric Hines who played with Muggsy and Delaney Rudd in Reynolds Gym and has lots of good memories and wishes he had some photographs. Um, and I've also received a request from Mary Tribble, Ed, to tell the story about the fancy golf cart. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we go from teeny tiny with the tiger pin, which is about three quarters of an inch in diameter, uh, to a golf cart. Uh, the golf cart was made for Mickey Mantle. Uh, it has the Yankee pinstripes on it. Uh, Mickey Mantle's number seven. Uh, it is shaped like a classic Rolls-Royce automobile. Uh, and the reason we have it is because Tommy Byrne uh, came to Wake Forest in 1939 to play baseball. Uh, he never left. He stayed here the rest of his entire life. As a matter of fact, served three terms as mayor of Wake Forest after he retired from baseball. Uh, but he played 13 seasons for the uh, New York Yankees. He and Mickey Mantle were best of friends, and he was also a great golfer, Tommy was. Uh, always played in Mickey Mantle's charity golf tournament. Uh, one year, the tournament happened to coincide with uh, Tommy Burns' birthday. Uh, and at the banquet, at the end of the tournament, 
uh, Mickey presented Tommy with his personal golf cart uh, as a gift, as a birthday gift. Uh, so uh, when Tommy passed away a few years ago, the Byrne family decided that we should have the golf cart here. So it is our largest artifact by far. We have no idea what the golf cart uh, is as far as monetary value. Uh, and what we do not have is uh, Mickey Mantle's rookie baseball card, which is worth a quarter of a million dollars. So I can only guess what his golf cart might be worth. Okay, uh, we've had a request for a Bruce Mallet interview. And someone also observed that, uh, and this is from Kerry King, Ed, you may know that Jackie Murdoch has a similar in illustration to the one of the hockey players showing a female tennis player. Uh, and actually, uh, Jack gave that to us. So uh, it is here in the collection as well. Not as in a good a condition as the, the hockey player, but we just love the hockey player because Way Forest played tennis, but nobody in North Carolina ice skated in the 19 teens. So, uh, so, you know, it, it's just a real unusual poster. But yes, the, hot, the uh, tennis poster uh, does exist. Okay, I think that's all of our questions. And so I'm going to let me check and make sure. Oh, an email address. I will respond to that directly. And I'm going to turn this over to Dean Tempiat, who is going to close us out. Thank you, Tanya, and thanks to everyone. This was a great program. I really appreciate all that your team does to put um, to you know to to bring programs like this to bring the arch archives and the library to everyone out there. I also want to give a big thank you to our presenters, Sarah, Ed, and Rebecca, and as well as to Barry and Mika for their support in making this event possible. And finally, I want to add a big thank you for our ZSR Board of Visitors and our Giving Society members and all of our friends who really are generous supporters and really help us make these programs possible. Thank you for spending some time with us today and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great evening.